I'm going to, I'm going to dive in. And uh, last time I was rather generous in my review of past material because uh, a number of people um, have had, you know, uh, difficulties um, with the scheduling and I wanted to make sure people were brought along. Uh, today, I'm um, going to be cutting to the chase much sooner, uh, but uh, I think everyone is uh, aware of uh, the general framework we have now, where we have schemas, a um, uh, couple levels of schema, which inherit, you know, from the graph schema for this LV lock of Volterra schema, um, which is uh, used to characterize wolves and sheep and and the location of each and the energy of wolves and sheep, as well as um, sort of a uh, an indicator of how much time is required for a given patch of ground, a given vertex to have uh, grass at sufficient levels to um, sustain a sheep. Um, and, and we have directions um, and we use attribute types and um, Past sessions have gone over this, and I think people are comfortable with the idea. The uh, countdown and the energy are all ints, and the uh, the directions are are symbols, right? And uh, this is a map of the schema, and, and we're going to come back to this. Actually, this is a presentation of the the schema, uh, a Hasse diagram, um, which illustrates the objects uh, as as these. Uh, uh, these ovals and the morphisms between them as these arrows. Um, and uh, these are used to illustrate uh, the attributes, right? And last time we discussed the um, uh, the database representation of this, which um, uh, should be, a, you know, a familiar one um, uh, and uh, made use of, of both foreign key tables where we had where we are outgoing morphisms from one object to another, and uh, some columns, uh, excuse me, some columns with foreign keys, and then some in which the attributes were directly embedded, like um, these ones here for the north, south, east, west um, uh, directions. Okay, um, so this is familiar, and uh, in past sessions, we've seen how we can make use of data migration functors to accomplish an economy of specification, specifying uh, the logic, for example, for sheep, and then uh, converting it to logic for wolf, uh, corresponding lo logic, mutatis mutandis, just adapting the inessentials for wolves. Um, uh, and, and then uh, we also saw how we could use data migration functors to specify this logic at the level of at the level of um, uh, factors without coordinates, without this kind of observation process, and then we could use data migration to introduce variables in here, which will involve pattern matching. Um, uh, when we go to apply the rewrite rules, and that pattern matching can kind of float along, transport along these uh, coordinates, which are present in the uh, actual derived schema, this LV prime schema. So this LV prime schema takes the basic business logic schema, the basic schema that gives the, the essential logic and adds coordinates. And uh, we're going to be able to use that coordinatized schema, which is more focused on layering in observation processes, just epiphenomenal processes that you know allow us to kind of uh, visualize what's going on uh, without mixing it in with the basic logic schema. And the logic schema is describing the core logic, the heart of the matter, um, the governing factors for the model. And this uh, schema is describing more epiphenomenal factors, factors that arise from that core logic, but don't influence it. Um, now, of course, what makes this tick for any of these schemas is the CSETs, right? It's it's the mapping of these uh, of these schema categories, such as that depicted here in this presentation, 
mapping them over into um, uh, Intiset or Finset. Uh, that's what allows us to get a set of sheep, oops, uh, a set of vertices, and to have sheep block be a map, a function uh, from the set of sheep to the set of vertices, saying for each sheep, what's its vertex, or for each wolf, what's its vertex, right? Um, uh, simple notion. And these edges reflect connectivity between the vertices, which is why they're in one of these uh, graph type of schemas, the, the normal schema to encode a graph, right? I, I think that should be uh, pretty comfortable for you. And the idea of mapping these to FinSet, of course, is is what gives rise, I say, of course, for those here, gives rise to this database type um, type characterization, right? I think it's it it's it should be all pretty comfortable. And the actual concrete um, underlying state we declare to be a schema uh, a coordinatized with the coordinatized schema, this LV prime. Um, so it has coordinates. Um, and uh, we're going to create an instance of that um, this with this initialize. And initialize is then um, going to be used to create a state of the world. And we're going to evolve that state of the world. And all the logic which we spec uh, specified without coordinates, because we're, we use this data migration, we specify all the logic without coordinates uh, like this. We, we went over this um, some last time. And uh, all the logic is built up that way. And then we use this, um, uh, this uh, schema, which, excuse me, this data migration functor um, F2, which converts it all to operate uh, uh, in terms of coordinates. And we have, uh, for various rewrite rules here, these sort of things that we've been dealing with, these sort of rewrite rules, we, um, uh, we basically are going to be able to uh, have them operate now on, uh, on, the, um, on the coordinatized uh, version of it, on these ones with coordinates. Um, and we saw these rules, right? Um, uh, th with the rules, we're uh, we're making use of excuse me um, uh, of that's not what I want um, of a uh, of a rewrite rule of this form uh, lir. So we have some invariant portion. We have a left portion that specifies uh, a pattern to be matched. A right uh, portion which specifies if we match this pattern, what do we replace it by? And we're finding that match within some current state of the world, X sub I. And by rewriting it, when we do find it, if we find it, we rewrite it with uh, with that replacement pattern uh, into a new state of the world. So L represents the pattern uh, that we're trying to find. X I is some context under which we try to apply that pattern. And we replace it by another pattern in some context and it updates that context. So that's the idea behind these rewrite rules. And you'll recall that for each such rewrite rule, we basically specify an L, an I, and an R. I is the part that's invariant, kept invariant. It's in L and it's also in R. So this is a monomorphism. And as it turns out, this is a monomorphism as well. Um, in this case, it doesn't have to be. But um, uh, anything that's an L, not an I, uh, gets deleted Any because it, it's it's not in the part held invariant. Anything that's an R and not an I gets created, right? Um, that's kind of the, the shorthand for it. And so when we specify these, we specify an L. And, uh, and then often we will explicitly specify an I and an R. Um, sometimes we uh, have a particularly simple case. So I'll show you one with an I and an R, like this one, the sheep forward. Um, so we have an L component, we have an I component, right? Um, and then we have an R component. Um, so the the L says basically, okay, we're 
Matsuka sheep. It's at the beginning of an edge. Uh, it's at the source vertex of some edge, which is in the direction of that sheep. And uh, the eye is just the uh, the the edge here. That's the thing which is maintained in variant. And the sheep uh, and the R basically says, hey, you know, um, we're going to now move the sheep over there. Uh, and the sheep's location is going to be at the other end of that edge, the target of that edge, that vertex now, instead of the source vertex of the edge, be at the, the target of that edge. And the direction is uh, the direction for this edge at which we're now located um, going out from here or from which we've come over is the direction of the sheep, right? Um, so here we have L, I, and R. And last time we talked some about application conditions, which can either be negative application conditions, conditions under which, for example, the sheep is too exhausted to move. And we say, do not apply this rule in that case. Or they can be per, uh, positive application conditions. They can be application conditions, which basically say um, under what conditions do uh, do apply this uh, this updated rule. And uh, here's a positive application condition, right? Where the sheep, th there needs to be a sheep in a place, in, in, a, in a location where there is grass ready to eat. The grass has zero counts left before it's ready to eat. And there's a positive application condition. That's what that is. That basically says, okay, when this is true, we we perform a rewrite. Um, we and uh, this rewrite is one that is going to only change the energy levels of the sheep and reset the um, reset the uh, number of ticks until the grass is ready to eat again. And so all it is doing is updating the attributes, so we don't actually rewrite. We don't actually map S, the input, over to R. Uh, we, we're, we're not changing uh, the sheep that's matched at all. Um, okay, so that was uh, the gist of, of uh, some of the key things. Now let's, let's go into a bit more detail. First of all, I wanted to show you uh, one of the most important things that I've been glossing over. And it's, it's a really important thing from several perspectives. Uh, it's important for efficiency. It's important for conceptual understanding. Um, it is uh, important in terms of the uh, some of the underlying mathematics. It is a wrinkle in what I've been saying. And I've been... Um, avoiding it um, both until I'm more clear about it and until um, until I, I feel we really need to do it. So you may have wondered um, when we have these uh, these big uh, these big nice visual characterizations here of the logic associated with our model. Logic for wolves, logic for sheep, logic for grass. Uh, excuse me, you may have wondered why everything needs to be labeled in this sort of way. After all, if, if we're just matching in, in kind of uh, this type of way with these uh, LIR, et cetera, uh, I may even have a, have a picture of it here somewhere. Um, why do we have to, why do we have to, you know, label this with W? Why do we have to label this with grass? Why do we have to label this with S? If we're just matching patterns in context and replacing them with an update in the C sets and these database like, you know, encodings of the current state. Why do we need to say, well, it's a sheep related rewrite or, a wolf related rewrite well um turns out it has something to do with these queries that 
of which I spoke in my closing minutes last time. So you'll notice these uh, these queries, and and these queries are um, are encoded here. Um, they take advantage of what's called the trace monoidal structure of this. Um, so they have these kind of loops associated with them. Let's check out this sheep one. So with the sheep one, we have, if there's a sheep, well, it gets processed down here. And uh, if the sheep doesn't die, we, we go on and get the next sheep. If the sheep does die, we the sheep disappears and we go back uh, up here. Same thing with wolves, there's a loop here. And the wolf, if it starves, goes back up um, to this to this port here, um, uh, as does uh, if it does not starve uh, as well. So these queries loop through successive sheep or successive grass or successive deceptive in instances of wolves. Um, they loop through them and they pick out each time a wolf or a sheep, or in this case, a vertex with grass in it, or a vertex. And all vertices um, have, uh, have some amount of, of grass. They have this compound attribute. Okay. Um, so it loops through and it finds each successive one. But why? Like, why are we doing that? Um, and what are the semantics of these different ports? Well, it um, th there is a semantic uh, semantics associated with these. Um, you could you can see some diagrammatic notation there, and it's hinted at a, a little bit here. B and C, in, in a trace monoidal context, this is going to be a loop around. That's exactly what we see with these sheep. We we have this middle port B. So this is kind of the B path. And we loop around back to the C path. So we have this loop. And I actually showed you last time a little loop like that. Um, but I didn't I didn't explain that it's every sheep is being found in this. And that that's what, what's happening. Um, A here is what happens when we're done with this looping. We, ha we have this thing coming in for A, and, and then when it's done looping, it'll, it'll fall through. Um, so it, it updates first the sheep here, and then it falls through and it updates the wolves, and it goes through and, and updates the wolves. So for the wolves as well, you have this sort of thing. And then it's going to update, um, it's going to fall through. That's the A port for wolves, fall through and update the grass. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, after that, it goes back to this while. Now, there's a rich story here associated with these constructs. You'll notice that most of what we've been dealing with are rewrite rules. And we're gonna focus mostly again on them today. Um, but these other ones, like the while or querying the sheep, the grass and the wolves, these actually are stateful contexts. You know, they go from successive sheep in a row, uh, successively down for, for the sheep here. Or they count down a certain number of, of uh, a certain number of uh, steps here. Um, and there's also a rich story associated with these things. So there's a monadic story here. We'll be getting to monads here. This system allows layering in, conceptually at least, theoretically at least, not sure the level of, of implementation support, it allows you to encode monads so we can have coming out of things a maybe monad, that says we may or may not get a value, um, be carrying a value. You can also have, for example, the distribution monad or a list monad um, to capture non-determinism, et cetera, you know, probabilistic non-determinism. There's a rich story here, and it's a polynomial functor story. 
polynomial functors are written all over um, these things, and they're related to the mealy machines that you've seen in the polynomial functors uh, uh, lectures. And we'll come to that. We'll come back home to polynomial functors. But first, let's finish the story with these rewrite rules. Because these, these things traveling down here, these wolves traveling down this, or the, the vertices traveling down this, or grass, um, or the sheep, they're not just traveling down it to say this is sheep-related stuff. They're traveling down it to accomplish something. We're saying, hey, go focus on this wolf or go focus on this sheep. So it's this sheep eating or not, depending whether the grass is ripe at where it is. It's this sheep that either turns left, turns right, or move forward. Okay. Um, so, so here, you know, these sorts of um, uh, encodings uh, these sorts of rules are going to be applied. These sorts of rewrite rules are going to be applied uh, in the context of uh, this sort of um, logic of, of uh, being applied to a certain sheep, a certain wolf, a certain vertex. Now, how does that happen? What's the story here? Well, there's a rich story. And it has to do with me showing you this picture rather than the other picture I showed you. The other picture was from uh, an earlier paper, and I, I, I don't know that I have it right now. It's not, it's not this, this one here. Maybe I, I don't have it handy right now. Um, let's, uh, yeah, okay. Um, yeah, so uh, it would be from, so what I had shown you before was a kind of slightly prettier version of this from the same paper, right? Um, uh, no, 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 sorry, it's not this paper, sorry, what am I doing? It's this one here. Um, this category uh, theoretic rewriting, and this is illustrating uh, double, so-called double push-out rewriting here. And I'd shown you this. And this is divorced from, you know, being applied to a certain sheep, a certain wolf. There's there's no indication of a certain wolf. It's just in this C set, we match it with another C set by C set transformation. C sets are functors, right? From a schema category to a set. And a C set transformation from one C set to another, a structure preserving mapping is a natural transformation. Um, and there's a, a nice story with that, with rewriting. This shows it uh, applied to simplicial complexes, but but there's a nice story. It could be associated with updating state. And it is relevant for ABMs, but the vast majority of our ABMs, for efficiency reasons and other things, um, tend to be applied with the updates applied in the context of particular agents, particular sheep particular wolves, particular vertices. So we're not matching the set of all possible, you know, the, the entire C set. We're not doing a rewrite in the entire state of, at once. We're rewriting this sheep or that wolf or this vertex associated with grass to make it grow. And you can imagine when you're finding a natural transformation here, when you're homing this to this, it's actually, it's a, you know, you're, you're, you're computing a morphism in a category of C sets. Um, performing such a hum is, is expensive. Um, if done naively, and there's there's um, great economies to secure by doing it for a smaller subset of that entire state. And uh, we're operating here for a particular wolf for sheep, and narrows what we have to update. 
Now, there's some other economies as well that I'll get to, but this is um, this is one of them. Okay. Now, what's going on here? Well, notice uh, this A and B, this uh, rewrite with A and B. And let's go back to our example, right? Um, maybe we're going to look at uh, the sheep eat, right? So you may remember the rule for sheep eat, right? Um, uh, sheep eat grass. So here we have a sheep and, and this AC set colon is it's a really beautiful construct, but basically it's finding sheep in the context of, of, of locations which have grass to eat, okay? Uh, and we have this application condition and so on, but um, what we have here is a uh, is going to be a particular sheep. So we're going to have this sheep eat rule, and and then this rule app around that is going to be morphed into this um, sheep sheep eat down here, and that's what's going to constitute this first this first element we we factorize out um we, we we have a general one that can be converted to wolfdom here um we separate it out from this so that we can just convert this to wolves since wolves eat in a rather different way than sheep okay so here's the sheep eat that's that same logic right um and it operates on an s a sheep um, that's our A. And our A is going to be arranged in this in this rewrite rule in this way. And what's key to understand is that the A kind of indicating which sheep we're indicating. Um, uh, we're going to have it be located over on the L side and B is going to be located on the R side. Now, in this case, B is going to also be a sheep. So we'll have a, uh, the sheep over here and the sheep over here. And it's essential to realize, to understand why this is working, that this is a commuting triangle here. It doesn't show it, but... Uh, the composition of this one and this one is this must be the same as this composition. I'm sorry, is this morphism? So this morphism has to be the composition of this after that, right? Or this first and then that. Uh, in other words, this morphism is as factorized by a by L. You know, a sub i has to be found in L. It, it, it has to, for this particular agent, it needs to have L match it, might be a way to put it. That pattern that L is, oh, uh, sorry. Uh, the pattern that L is encoding, which in this case for sheep eat, is, is, is this pattern, right? This AC set colon that creates an AC set. And there's some slick stuff going on there. We'll come to maybe next time. Um, uh, ideally this time, but I, I don't think um, I'm likely to get to it. But this AC set that comes out of this, uh, this AC set colon, it's an AC set, right? We, we talked about this is an AC set sorry, an ATCHED, if, if, if you prefer, think of it as a C set, right? Um, a mapping from a schema category to set with some bells and whistles with the with the attribute types. This is a C set. We're trying to find a, a homomorphism between them. We're trying to find a, a hum between them. We're trying to find a, a, a structure preserving mapping between them, trying to use different words that may make others, different people comfortable. We're trying to find this pattern in this state of the model. 
but what we're doing is we're specifically requiring that this pattern apply to our A sub I, our particular sheep be matched by that pattern. In other words, ah, our particular sheep has to be in this situation. Our sheep, sheep number 34, right? Has to be in this situation. Then we'll go on to 35, and then we'll go on to 36. It's only if our sheep is, is in this, is matched by this pattern, there'll be a homomorphism there, and there'll be a homomorphism finding it here, and the, the composite is this. Um, so where our sheep is in the general state is where this pattern matches in the entire state. And we could factorize this through L because this pattern is characterizing this pattern in A sub I. If that pattern is characterizing our particular sheep over which we're looping, then by goodness, we're, we're going to replace, replace it with this. And in this case, our sheep is going to be, it's going to be the same sheep here that it's going to apply here. Our, our sheep is the one whose state is being updated. You know, when we update the state, it's our sheep is part of that. Up, sheep's update is part of that, that update of the state. So these, these components lead it to sort of scope the update to the appropriate um, agent, right? Um, to, on the one hand, the sheep. We apply those rules we've seen. You know, turning left, turning right, moving forward, reproduce, starve to the sheep. Now, if sh let's suppose sheep B doesn't match, right? Let's suppose that we have this sheep eat thing and this application condition, this positive application condition, this condition under which it fires, this guy here, it's not true for our particular sheep, sheep 34 right now that we've looped over. If it doesn't pass, then we go out via this path here. Um, excuse me, we go out via this one. Um, otherwise, we go out via this one. So this is the one if it fails, and this is the one if it succeeds, okay? So we, um, if it does match, we go out here, we've got a B coming out of it, which in this case is just a sheep as well. Otherwise, we, we go out um, A. And so, you know, our sheep 34 may not eat because it's not in the position where L matches, and that's fine. It just falls through in this case. Right? And uh, and then uh, similarly, you know, we may go this way or this way or this way probabilistically. And there's a, there's a logical rule for that that we talked about a bit last time, right? One out of four chance um it'll it'll go left one out of four chance or two out of four chance it'll go straight and one out of four chance it'll turn right okay um so our particular sheep is is flowing down through here and whenever we have a rewrite rule for sheep eat for turn left for turn right for move forward for reproduce for starve you know, these are based on rewrite rules. And sometimes those rewrite rules apply. Sometimes they don't apply and will come out of different ports at the end of each of these, depending on that. Um, uh, but then at the end, we'll go back um, and go on to another sheep. And the same thing with waltz, right? And the same thing with grass. Okay. so. We have this focus, and it's more than just this is a sheepish thing. It's more like for this sheep, do do this. Now, there's there's more depth to it. First of all, these query sheep are coming from this thing. This sheep is this whole thingamabob, this whole 
this whole thing. Wolf is this one here. And the grass is this rule that we we saw right here where the grass increments. The beauty of it is these are just morphisms composed together. This is, you know, particularly simple, this grass ink, wherever it is, it's just uh, a particularly, you know, simple one, but otherwise we we've just composed these together, right? These are these are morphisms. Um, these are AC sets and, and morphisms but between AC sets. Um, but here what we have is this kind of logical components. Now, again, there's a bigger story here. This turn, this, uh, for example, this, this kind of flipping the coins here, um, right? Um, and this uh, maybe associated with, um, uh, with whether or not they move. Um, uh, these are associated with, um, or excuse me, this is, excuse me, associated with reproduction. Um, I believe these are also based on polynomial functors and this idea of kind of a lottery with which some of you are, are familiar. So this is, again, polynomial functor constructs, and you notice they're colored kind of differently because of this. So we have this iteration going on that has these foci and that zero in on particular agents and update things in the context of those agents are performing these sort of matches. And we have this sort of failure that can occur, fail, fail, fail here if we have um, certain types of uh, unusual uh, conditions applying. And I think here it's associated with like, if there's no agents whatsoever to loop over or something like that. Not not that just there's no agents left, that's fine. But I think if there's no agents uh, whatsoever to, um, uh, to loop over. Okay, now, um, so, so here we have rewriting that is scoped, right? Now, um, and that limits, you know, how much we have to rewrite. We're not rewriting the whole C set uh, at at once. Um, uh, okay, um, a few more things I want to talk about, though. Um, and I'm watching the time, and and I'll have to go pretty soon. Uh, so, one thing is that uh, this. Um, I, I want to tidy up something that we talked about last time. So last time we had gone through this kind of other example, this example drawn from baseball, some you know sports team, right? And and we had gone and we had looked at the AC set colim strategy for creating these kind of C sets to be matched here, like a wolf and a sheep together at the same location um versus defining them manually and in in our paper in this particular blog post you'll find you know this is a more traditional way of saying there's a sheep and we have to say like there's a vertex and here's the sheep a single sheep and there's a vertex where the sheep is at and has a direction and there's an energy that there too because there's an energy for the sheep plus energy is used as well for um for encoding the countdown associated with the vertex and this you know this is conceptual overhead it's kind of like distracting detail that's taking us away from the domain understanding of the world the kind of model that we're building and plopping us down into this welter of sort of categorical detail needed to construct a CSET. And what we saw, is, so that's an AC set, right? That's an AC set. That could give us one of these things. But we saw a slicker way to do that. Uh, one that's more, it's not just slicker, it's more, it's more conceptually parsimonious. There's less distracting detail. It's more declarative. It's to just say, hey, I have a sheep, right? Or to say, I have a vertex. Or 
to say, you know, I have a, I have a, um, I have a sheep and a wolf where the wolf location is the same as the sheep location, or I have a sheep where, you know, it's, it's located at a place where there's grass to be eaten, right? Um, these are conceptually sweet things, but you may wonder like where, okay. I mean, that's nice, but like, how could it possibly know? Like, like this is specifying there's a vertex. It's specifying that there's two energy. Where is that here? How does it know? That, ladies and gentlemen, is the magic of, of pre-sheets. That is the magic of representables. So here's the thing. It has this schema category. And it actually figures out the representables from this. Some of you may have been with me one or two times ago, I think two times ago, where I talked about the representables for a given object. Each object is associated with a whole functor that maps, well, it's a functor from this category into set. So it maps, or pin set, so it maps each object to a set. And what is that set? Well, it's the homs from our object of, of concern. So maybe this is the, the representable for sheep. And it maps every object in the category, say V, to the to a set. And what set is it? It's the set of the the hump set from sheep to V, which in this case is a single element in it. Guess what, folks? Guess what that single element is? It's this guy right here, or this gal right here. This energy, this there energy thing, um, the two. Well, um, we're going to have for the sheep, we're going to have a we're gonna have the, the home set, right? Um uh associated with uh any particular object. If we if we did it with energy, humor me by pretending gets an object. We have two morphisms. We have this one from sheep to energy, and we have this one from sheep to energy, the composite of these two. Remember? Um, if we have, if if you have a morphism from A to B and from B to C, there's automatically, we know there's one from A to C by the rules of a category. So these, there are two morphisms. And guess what? That gives us this. So, it computes those representables and that AC set column uses those. And, and it's it's all part of this. It figures out what all these things need to be from the, the representables. And that's one of the reasons why you do this Unita cache. It's computing the representables for this uh, for the schema. Now I recognize that will mean something more to some of you than to others. Um, we'll, we'll talk again about representable functors sometime soon, but it's, um, it's sort of computing the basic building blocks, almost the orthogonal building blocks for this, or the, you know, uh, kind of the natural basis that would be a better way to put it for this category. And that gives us these, these things that otherwise we would have to specify by hand. It also lets us, by computing these, match much more efficiently, in many cases, these sort of things. It's pre-computed the representables. We don't have to recompute them on an ongoing basis. So we we could just compute these things. So um, it turns out that we can compute these AC set colims. And if I'm not mistaken, we may be able to do this matching better, more quickly, because we've already pre-computed the representables. So that hefty computation, which you probably saw go on where we do the Oneda cache, it pays off. It pays off in allowing us to sort of get this, this flexibility. Um, so, so we're getting closer. We're getting closer to a more complete understanding of this. There are a couple more things 
um, that will want to understand. And then I'm just getting my heads around like this weaken in this strength and, and so on. And you'll see them occasionally uh, referred to. But I think the picture is starting to come into focus of a model declarative by virtue of rewrite rules, declarative by virtue of, of specifying these conditions um, used in the rewrite rules, having this nice looping implemented in a functional way, in fact, by, uh, uh, by use of polynomial functors, and the ability to layer a monad in to capture additional computational effects. The ability to use these data migration functors to achieve extra independence of the epiphenomenal situation, the observer processes from the underlying logic. For me, it's a, it's a quite beautiful picture that's coming together and we're getting close. I think we're getting within range of implementing some of our own models with this uh, framework. And with those words, uh, I will close.